Lindsay Lennox's song Beautiful Jersey, a sentimental ode by a Victorian Englishman, has won a place in local hearts, especially as a patriotic song during the World War II German occupation. It is regularly performed in Gerrier, our local French patois. The lyrics capture the island as a utopia, a place where one longs to be. This paper explores Jersey's rich supernatural folklore and how locals and tourists, past and present, engaged with and envisaged the island's landscape, forging a sense of place and history, hinting at a charming supernatural realm. The richness of folklore in this small British Channel Island generates an intensity of space and an abundance of uncanniness. Foucault's concept of heterotopia can be used as a lens through which to explore folkloric landscapes, helping us to understand how different groups might engage with the folklore of place. Heterotopias are vaguely defined by Foucault in Of Other Spaces as countersites, an enacted utopia attached to a physical location, encountered in almost every culture. They are delineated by their difference and dislocation from the everyday. Heterotopias are the other space. Foucault compares heterotopias to a process of mirroring, a way of perceiving space that reflects aspects of culture back upon us. Supernatural folklore mapped up onto the landscape can be viewed through a heterotopic lens. Spectres that haunt the landscape, they are in a real place, but also of another realm. The Vioge monster causes terror to children who walk up Le Rue et à la Vioge, or Crack Ankle Lane. The black dog, Le Chien de Bully, uh, haunts the winding hill of Bully Bay and had a pub named after it. The jilted bride of Waterworks Valley appears with her ghostly wedding party and also recently graced the floral float at the annual Battle of Flowers Festival. In particular, fairies, or Le Petit Fetio, haunt the dolmens and menhirs and standing stones. Fairyland is another world, just as heterotopias are the other space. Fairy beliefs mould and reshape human culture and reflect back a distorted vision. In 1912, when members of the Societe Jazier were digging at Mont Grante, a local warned them, idiots, my goodness, what sacrilege. If you disturb the fairies, you will bring trouble on the neighbourhood. The elderly man perceived this as another space. The soil was not just soil, it was can uncanny and belonged to the other world. Disturbing it could have grievous implications. At dolmen sites, there is a build-up of time and layers of meaning. These stones were often sacred burial sites. They had been used by locals to graze animals and even for building material. Dolmens, sitting in the landscape for millennia, have attracted stories, legends and superstitions which set them aside. Like cemeteries, they are the other city, a space where uh, life meets death and the natural meets the supernatural. These spaces also interrupt time continuums with long-lived spectres that transcend the timescales of human memory, attaching themselves to a site for generations. As Johnson notes, when we enter such heterotopias, we step into a world that mirrors, condenses and transforms the space outside, offering opportunities and dangers. The heterotopia is capable of juxtaposing in a single real place several spaces several sites that are in themselves incompatible. In St. Wands at Le Trois Rock, the fairies, in little aprons, carry round the dolmens to scare potential invaders. J. H. Lamy, in Jersey Folklore, written in 1927, noted that Le Table de March and also the passage grave La Sergente in St. Brelard's were built by the fairies. Folklore collector Dr. Simmons, who Lamy quotes, noted that the little people were seen working at Le Sergente with little tools excavating places for themselves underground. There is a rich folklore built up around the island's standing stones and dormants. Furthermore, many prehistoric stones were la labelled as Druidic temples by 19th century tourist guides and, visitors, um, and visited for picnics and sightseeing. The promise of the supernatural transgresses the boundaries of reality. Setting aside these sites as different, they became portals to other realms, several places in a single space. In one such instance, we can observe how a site acquired a supernatural legend via a tourist guide written by a mainland visitor. Octavius Rooks in the Channel Islands Pictorial, Legendary and Descriptive, written in 1856, dedicated his own sentimental Victorian tale to the healing spring of Fontaine de Mitte on Belhoog Point. 
The nearby fields of Le Pucali and Le Clos de Pucalet denote fairy places, a supernatural landscape. Rook, indulging in daydreams, was artistically engaged with this special sight as he travelled round the island. He imagined nymphs of an old religion as guardians of the spring. The two fairies, Arna and Aeona, were given an allotted time in Jersey. When their time was over, God sent an angel to recall them to heaven. Yet they were so sorrowful to leave their beautiful home, they wept, and the tears became the spring. Before Rook introduced this story, the spring was connected with healing eyes and restoring speech, as noted in A Week's Visit to Jersey, written in 1844. The spring continues to be used today by locals. Supernatural tales made excellent cover for tourist guides in the 19th century, adding a touch of the numinous to scenic areas. Another such example is the legend of the fairies moving St Brellard's Parish Church foundation stones to its peculiar location just on the water's edge of the bay. This is a common folkloric theme found in Guernsey and also English churches. The earliest mention of the St Brellard's legend appears in an account of the island of Jersey by W. Pleas in 1817, merely mentioning the fairies moving the foundation stones. The legend became more elaborate in later guidebooks. A week's visit to Jersey in 1844 contained a verse account. Rook gives a very colourful version, as does Thomas Williams in Jersey Legends in Verse, written in 1865. In Williams's poem, Jersey is the last bastion for the fairies before they disappear to the moon, troubled by the world of discord and hate. A week's visit to Jersey guides tourists to Cheval Rock, the site of an ossified sea kelpie horse. Again, this site juxtaposes two spaces, both the natural and the supernatural, as a point of interest for those who are out of everyday time on holiday. Other spaces are alternative spaces, altered spaces, and often alternating spaces, in the sense that two different time spaces come together and switch from one into the other. The rock on this scenic spot is also a rock in a geological form, but also Cheval Guillaume, Cheval Rock, the ossified sea kelpie stallion that a gentleman named William lost to the waves. It enchants the tourist experience who re envisages the legend in the tourist guide. Heterotopias are most often linked to slices in time, which is to say, they open onto what might be termed, for the sake of symmetry, heterochronies. The heterotopia begins to function at full capacity when men arrive at a sort of absolute break with their traditional time, such as a holiday. Holidays create a break from time. They are distinct from everyday experience. Another time for rest and play. An island holiday is a time marked out from the everyday in a space which is also separated. Furthermore, people might spend their time touring sites, which themselves are othered in the island's landscape. These special sites forming part of the charmed tourist map. For example, Benjamin Clark's A Tourist Guide to Jersey in 1879 suggests a packed expert excursion itinerary. He guides visitors to Devil's Hole, Druidic Harbour, Witch's Rock. He describes his vague tale behind the place named Jeffrey's Leap, with Jeffrey surviving being thrown into the sea. The sense of spatial intensity in history abounds. The island's landscape becomes a canvas for a deep, lost folkloric, semi-mythologised past, which people visit in a spa space separated away, in a time separated away. The sea surrounds Jersey, which is only accessible via air or sea. The abundance of 19th century tourist guides in which much supernatural folklore appears demonstrates the intensity of landscape and seascape. Foucault noted that heterotopias always presuppose a system of opening and closing that both isolates them and makes them penetrable. The sea provides a boundary. Those coming here must travel. We are both connected and also cut off by the sea. There is a spatial intensity to this. Uh, the island's nature is set apart, which is a key feature of a heterotopia. Johnson points out that heterotopias are macrocosmic and microcosmic. They replicate and exaggerate or reduce another world. 
Similarly, islands do this. Every hedgerow and every field has memories and folklore mapped into the landscape. Knowledge of the landscape and experience of space is heightened when lifestyles are experienced in tiny geographical areas, generation after generation. In an island, time also builds up like a library. Events and material culture accumulate like layers of the soil in the archaeological landscape. The tourist aspects of heritage uh, like to focus upon walking through deep time, visiting the past where one location can juxtapose and accumulate multiple eras of time.